Hello, I'm Miguel Ambrona from NTT Laboratories. I'm a postdoc student there under the supervision of Masayuki Abe. And today I'm going to talk about my work on generic negation of pair encoding schemes. Pair encodings are a primitive that is used to build attribute based encryption. So I'm going to first uh, start by defining what attribute based encryption is. In attribute based encryption, there is a master authority. So for an example, think of a university where there are students, there are professors and many users. And this authority can provide with secret keys to, to the different parties. So for example, in this case, the university will give a secret key to the student who is a PhD student in mathematics. So the key will, will be associated to those values, which are called attributes. And uh, the second student, uh, in this case, let's, let's say it's, uh, she's a master student in mathematics. Now, consider a party who has a file some document and that wants to be sh she wants to share this document with uh, uh, some parties, but not with everybody. So she is in fact thinking of a policy. She wants to share this document with professors or PhD students in mathematics. So she can leverage this attribute-based encryption system to produce a ciphertext out of this file. And the ciphertext can now be published, for example, in the university server. Everybody can see it, but only those who have a secret key which satisfies the policy will be able to decrypt. So in this case, the first student will be able to decrypt, but the second student cannot. And in attribute-based encryption, we also want to forbid collusion. So for example, let's say that uh, uh, the second student, she has a friend who is a PhD student in chemistry. Even though these two keys individually have attributes which uh, potentially could uh, satisfy this policy, it should be impossible to combine both keys uh, and decrypt. So more more formally, an attribute-based encryption for a predicate P consists of four algorithms. The setup algorithm that produces a pair of keys. This algorithm is supposed to be run by the university in our previous example. And the key generation algorithm, which requires the master secret key. This is only known by the university. And on input, an attribute Y produces a secret key for Y. Encryption, which can be run by everybody who knows the master public key. On input, an attribute X produces secret text for X. And a key, a symmetric key, which uh, can be used as a key encapsulation mechanism. And then there is the decryption algorithm, which on input a key and a cipher text will produce the symmetric key, which is supposed to be the, the same one produced during encryption, if the predicate between X and Y holds or both otherwise. Attribute-based encryption was, was first conceived by Sahari and Waters in 2005, and it was later actually introduced by Goyal and others. Originally, it was designed in the flavor of key policy attribute-based encryption, but there are other other versions of it. For example, ciphertext policy, where um, policies are in the ciphertext and the keys are associated to attributes. That That's the example that we saw with the university. But nowadays, the notion of attribute-based encryption has been generalized, and thanks to big effort by the community, there exist efficient uh, schemes for a rich variety of predicates. So, for example, uh, we have a zero inner product encryption, where x and y are both vectors, and uh, decryption will hold if the inner product of between these vectors is zero. But other examples are, for example, um, monotone access structures or hierarchical identity-based encryption, large universe attribute-based encryption where the number of attributes is uh, exponential, maybe exponential, number of uh, existing attributes, um, polynomial size circuits, regular languages, and there are many others. But uh, however, despite this uh, great progress in the field, designing better schemes in terms of size, performance, security, and expressivity became really hard until two breakthrough through constructions appeared in 2014. So these are the works by We and Atrapatum, which are two independent uh, works that propose uh, generic and unifying frameworks for designing attribute-based encryption schemes for different predicates. But both works define um, what is called an encoding and then follow the dual system methodology to construct to construct a compiler that on input the encoding for certain predicate P produces a fully secure attribute-based encryption for, for that predicate.
This framework remarkably simplify the design and study of attribute-based encryption schemes because the designer can focus on the construction of the simpler encoding for the desired predicate and then uh, you can just use the compiler to get the attribute-based encryption scheme and analyzing the security of, the, of these encodings is much simpler. So in the framework of Wii, they define what's called uh, predicate encodings and it's the framework of Atrapadon where they define pair encodings and this is the primitive that we study in this work. So both works were generalized to the prime order setting and there are other subsequent uh, works about uh, pair encodings and predicate encodings that refine these notions. So we are going to focus on, on the framework by Atrapadon, started by Atrapadon, about pair encodings. And this is supposed to be uh, the most expressive one. Now let me define what a pair encoding actually is. So a pair encoding, with respect to certain predicate, consists of four algorithms. The first algorithm just takes certain parameters defined by the predicate and produces an integer. This integer corresponds to the number of common variables. We'll see, we'll see what these are in a second. And the other two encodings, the key encoding and the ciphertext encoding, they just produce polynomials. So this k represents a vector of polynomials on several variables. And um, what I want to point out uh, is that in this uh, set of variables r hat, there is this distinguished variable called al alpha. Uh, Ciphertext encoding also outputs uh, a set of polynomials, a list of polynomials on different variables. But as you can see, this b uh, appears in both. That's why they are called the common variables. And here there is a distinguished um, variable, the s0. Finally, there is a fourth algorithm that outputs two matrices. And there are several conditions on the pair encoding scheme. So one of them is the structural constraints, which basically says that uh, this list of polynomials k produced by the, the key encoding, they can only contain this, this type of monomials, these types of monomials. Either a common variable multiplied by one of these R variables called the non long variables, or uh, the so called long variables alone. And uh, similarly, ciphertext encodings can only be formed of, of uh, this, this type of variables. Okay, that said, um, there is an extra condition which is that if the predicate between X and Y holds, then these matrices uh, satisfy the following equality uh, symbolically, so as polynomials. Finally, there is an, an extra condition called a non-reconstructability, or which is the one that provides security, which says that when the predicate does not hold between X and Y, then this equality should not hold for any possible value of the matrices E and E prime. Okay, now let me ex briefly explain you how how this encoding is then used to build attribute-based encryption scheme. So this is a simplification of the actual compiler, but I think it gives a good intuition of how it works. So we are over, over a bilinear, bilinear uh, group, and the master public key will be just uh, the generator of the target group to the, the power of the secret element alpha, and the uh, generator of the first group to the power of the common variables. Or right, alpha and the common variables are the master secret key. Then keys, secret keys, have this form. So polynomials k are used in the exponent of uh, G2. And ciphertexts have this form. Very similar. And notice that the key encapsulation mechanism is just uh, GT to the power of this interesting polynomial between the two distinguished variables. So now uh, this property over here, reconstructability, guarantees that um, if, you, if your x and y satisfy the predicate, then you will be able to combine these, these terms over here in order to get um, the key encapsulation in, in the target group. So the way you do it, you will pair this element with uh, 
these elements here and vice versa here and then apply uh, make linear algebra in, in the exponent let's see an example this is probably the simplest uh, pair encoding scheme so for the predicate and the identity based encryption predicate where the predicate between x and y holds if x is equals y in this case uh, n equals 3 so we can say the first algorithm outputs 3 um, these are the the key encoding and ciphertext encoding key encoding has two polynomials ciphertext encoding has only one on these uh, variables and in this case and uh, those matrices allow reconstructability to see why you can simply check that uh, if you multiply s0 by this polynomial and s1 by this polynomial and subtract this other polynomial what you get is this and notice that when x equals y these two terms will cancel out and you will end up with um, s0 times alpha Argon non-reconstructability is uh, more involved but th there is a very nice way of uh, doing it for this example which is uh, finding an assignment of the variables that uh, vanishes all the polynomials so you can check, you can actually check that this assignment vanishes all polynomials, but it does not vanish polynomial S0 times alpha, because actually both S0 and alpha are, are equal one. So if this happens, then it's uh, it's clear that uh, you cannot have reconstructability, otherwise you would have a contradiction. The following, you can, you can reason uh, in the following way. And you derive that zero must be equal to one, which uh, is obviously a contradiction. And notice that um, this assignment is using the inverse of x minus y. So actually, this assignment is only well defined if the predicate is false. But that's fine because that's all we want. This is just an example, but there exist uh, pair encodings for a rich variety of predicates. However, and it's uh, natural to ask the question of whether we can transform or combine pair encodings. And in fact, uh, this has been done. So starting from a predicate, uh, sorry, from a pair encoding scheme for a certain predicate P, one may want to, to transform this uh, into a pair encoding scheme for the dual predicate, which is defined as follows. So basically you just swap the roles of X and Y. And uh, this has been done by uh, Trapadung and, and Yamada in 2015. And they also did the conjunction. So starting from two different uh, pair encoding schemes for two different predicates, just build one pass for the, the conjunction of these two predicates. You can also do this junction. This junction is very easy. You can just run uh, both, uh, both schemes in parallel. However, um, how about the negation? Negation is harder. And it was not done before. It, it has been done in a limited framework of um, predicate encodings by myself. And so this was under my PhD. And this uh, predicate encoding uh, setting, as I said, is less expressive than pair encodings. And this, op this problem was open for the case of pair encodings, general pair encodings. And it's what we try to solve in this work. So in this work, we propose a generic transformation that takes any pair encoding scheme and produces a new pair encoding scheme for the negated predicate. So as I said, we solved this problem that was open for the case of uh, general generic negation of pair encodings. So along the way, we provide an algebraic characterization of pair encodings that can be of independent interest. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. And our transformation leads to new, new encodings. For example, we propose the first pair encoding for negated doubly spatial encryption, which I'm going to explain what it is uh, later. And uh, finally, we, we are going to discuss other implications of our results and uh, why I think uh, this transformation is, is important. In order to define our generic negation transformation, we're going to modify the way we look at uh, pair encoding schemes. So I'm going to define a new way, a new definition of encoding, um, which I like to think about it as splitting an encoding into layers. So there'll be as many layers as there are common um, variables plus one. 
So instead of producing polynomials, uh, the way I see the encoding, this is what I call the algebraic encoding, is two algorithms that produce matrices. And there is a correspondence between these matrices and previous polynomials, which is as follows. And by the way, uh, I am assuming that the key encoding is of a certain specific form, namely alpha only appears in one of the polynomials, and that polynomial is of this form. So this, uh, this assumption can, uh, is uh, without a loss of generality that has been used many times in the literature, um, for example by Atrapadun. And uh, one way of uh, saying why it's uh, without loss of generality is, is applying the dual transformation twice. So if you apply Atrapadun's dual transformation, which is an involution, you will get an encoding that is of this form. Uh, our polynomials can be seen as uh, the multiplication of these matrices by the corresponding common variable and then all multiplied by the non-long variables and we add c times the long variables the same structure goes here and this structure is possible thanks to the structural constraints on the polynomials that they only contain uh, this kind of monomials respectively and it's very useful to look at uh, this uh, at pair encodings as matrices instead of polynomials and to look at the reconstructability uh, property in terms of matrices. Namely, in this case, we say uh, an algebraic encoding is uh, reconstructable if for every x and y that satisfy the predicate there exist matrices E and E' prime such that all these equations hold. So here I'm being very explicit with the dimensions but it, it's not very important now. So this means the zero matrix, and this is just a zero matrix whose first element is a one. So the the, the element on uh, the first column and the first uh, row is a one. Everything else is zero, and it can be shown that uh, this this set of uh, equations here is equivalent to the previous reconstructability. So why is this useful? Well, this is useful because we can now leverage a very powerful result from the linear algebra that has been widely used in, in the literature, which says that a certain system is unsatisfiable. So there, is, there is no v such that a times v equals z, if and only if there exists a w that vanishes a without vanishing z, roughly. And this is so powerful and it's what we are going to use in order to build our negated encoding. So you can think of this property as non-reconstructability. So for all solutions, a certain system is not satisfiable. This is what you have when, when the predicate is false, you have non-reconstructability. Then there is a dual world where things are actually reconstructable. So the intuition is that if, if we can somehow transpose all the matrices involved in, in our encoding, uh, we can create uh, an encoding for the negated predicate. In this work, we use a modified uh, version of the previous lemma that is uh, closer to what we need, which is as follows. I'm being very explicit with the dimensions of the matrices, but just ignore this. What this lemma says is that if you have matrices, AI, BI, CI, and A hat, B hat, then these two conditions are equivalent. So there does not exist a solution x, y to this system of equations if and only if there exists a solution to this other system. Notice that the first, the first statement here is very close to our reconstructability condition here. So there is a correspondence between the solution x and matrix E, solution y and matrix E prime, and you can check that there is actually a correspondence between everything. I mean, this, this, this lemma has not been designed uh, by chance. It's just uh, exactly what we need. And now the question is whether we can use these matrices that define our encoding in transposed manner so that we can leverage the second statement uh, when the predicate is false, which will give us reconstructability of the negated encoding. So here is my negation transformation. The matrices corresponding to common variables, both here and here, are very sparse. Almost all the entries are zero, except for a few ones. 
So now that we have a generic transformation that uh, negates any pair encoding scheme, let me talk a little bit about the consequences of this. So first of all, we can negate any encoding. So people were designing uh, both the normal version of an encoding and their negated one by hand, but now we can we can get the negated version for free. And maybe there is some encoding for which no negate, negated version was known. And this is actually the case of double spatial encryption. And I'm very grateful to Atrapadung because he pointed this out. Given a vector and matrix, another vector and a matrix, the predicate is one if and only if these two um, spaces intersect. And there was a predicate for, uh, sorry, a pair encoding for this predicate by Atrapadung. And it has this form. But there was, uh, we didn't know how to build this, a uh, negated version of this predicate. And our negated transformation gives us, to the best of uh, my knowledge, the first uh, pair encoding for negated double spatial encryption. And it looks as follows. You can pause the video and, and analyze it uh, slowly, but I just wanted to point out that this is a pair encoding scheme for this predicate. So predicate is one if and only if these two uh, spaces do not intersect. Our results tell us uh, new information about uh, the expressivity of uh, pair encodings. So for example, now we know that the set of predicates that can be expressed with uh, pair encodings is closed under negation. We didn't know this before. Why is this useful? Well, this suggests that maybe building pair encodings for context-free languages is harder than we think, or it's maybe impossible. We can capture regular languages, but it was it wasn't known whether context-free languages could be captured or not. But notice that context-free languages are not closed under complementation, and therefore, if we can build pairing code schemes for context-free languages, we could also build pairing code schemes for a predicate class that is strictly more powerful than context-free languages. Maybe achieving context-free languages is is not possible. Other consequences are po potential performance improvements. N notice that um, our results tell us that every pair encoding um, can be expressed in this manner, where the common variable matrices are of this form. Like They do not depend on the predicate. All the part that depends on the predicate is in this uh, lone variables uh, matrix. So why is this useful? Well, uh, this can lead to, to efficiency improvements First of all, you can pre-compute this part, which is common for every predicate. And second, second of all, the part that depends on the predicate is here, and the part on uh, long variables can be batched very efficiently, whereas this other part cannot be batched so efficiently. I give more details in the paper about this. So in general, our new generic transformation tells us that every pre-encoding can be expressed of this on this form. So if, if you don't see why, well, you can just negate it twice and you'll get it of this form, but in general, maybe there is an easier way of doing it. And having it in this form, it's very useful because it can lead to efficiency improvements. So I have presented my work on generic negation of pair encoding schemes. I hope this uh, this gives us a better understanding of uh, of this primitive. And also, I mean, it led to new encodings and uh, can potentially lead to performance improvement. So it will be useful to know, to really implement these ideas and, and see um, what they can lead to. And also as future work, it will be good to extend our techniques to this new framework by Atrapadung and Tomida, where they perform uh, dynamic composition in the standard model of attribute-based encryption. And notice that our, our techniques are um, applied to a scenario where uh, there is a Q-type assumption. It's not a completely standard model. So it'll be good to, uh, to know whether our techniques apply to this other framework, a very recent work by Atrapadung and Tomida. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. That was it.